Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, happy new year. Welcome back to the Tom Woods Show, episode 2435. Is that what I just said? It's 2,435. It is 2,435. With Dave Smith of Part of the Problem, which in very subtle manner, he indicates to us he is the host of. He is a stand-up comedian who, f- you've been all kind of all over the place uh, in 2023 doing comedy. Uh, maybe maybe more, I mean, obviously you had the interruption with COVID, but are you busier as a comedian than you've ever been? Uh, yeah, this last year I've worked I've, I've been on the road probably more than ever. I mean, I used to be on the road quite a bit when I was a younger comic, like opening for, for other comedians, featuring, as we call it. Um, and then it wasn't just, uh, it was like life. Like I had my first kid in December of 2018. So then, you know, for the beginning of 2019, I kind of slowed down. Then I started going, but then the world shut down in 2020. I had my second kid in 2021. And so then it was like, uh, and he had some health complications and stuff like that. So it was uh, my ability to tour got, you know, was interfered with for quite a bit there. But th- this year I was out on the road a lot and I'm going to be out on the road a lot in 2024. You have become an even bigger name uh, here as we start uh, 2024 than ever before. And you know, your name pops up all over the place. You have absolutely top flight guests on part of the problem. I mean, most of the time you, you don't have guests. Um, you know, you're stuck with old Robbie the fire, but occasionally (laughs) have a guest and you had Tucker Carlson not that long ago. So I knew you knew him and I knew you talked to him, but I didn't know you were going to have him on. I found out just like every other, uh, schmo out there. And I watched it as it premiered. And the whole time I thought this is such a great coup for Dave and it's going to get him exposed to a whole lot of new people who need to hear from Dave. How'd that happen, first of all? And then I want to talk about some of the things that uh, resulted from it. Well, t- so me and Tucker kind of became friendly. At, he texted me out of the blue. Uh, and this was, I don't know, this is back a year and a half, two years ago or something like that. And uh, he just, literally, I just got a text from a random number after uh, doing Rogan. And he sent me a clip from something I did on Rogan. And he goes, uh, he goes hey, man, it's Tucker Carlson. Uh, this is, uh, you know, I thought this was so great and just sent me a clip of mine. And so then I texted Kennedy, uh, who's a good friend of mine who I've known forever, you know, the libertarian, uh, at Fox business for years there who, who had that great show. And I was like, Hey, I just got a text from this number. Is this Tucker Carlson? And she was like, that is Tucker Carlson. And so whatever, we just started texting and we text all the time. Like it's been for a long time, but like he never invited me on his show. I never invited him on my show, but we'll just like text for a long time about, you know, everything about what's going on in the country. And then the last time I was on Rogan, he did it again. He sent me a clip and he goes, dude, this was just perfect or something I said there. And then I finally, at that point, I was like, worked up the courage. I was just like, Hey, will you come on my podcast? And he was like, absolutely. I'd love to. And then I was like, well, this is pretty stupid. I should have asked him a long time ago to (laughs) come on my show. But yeah, it was, it's, it's interesting, man. And like, like you said, things have been, uh, it's kind of in, in my career has been, uh, uh, at least from my perspective, it seems like a steady, slow progression. Like I never had like a jump where I went from like, oh, uh, you know, which I know people who have had jumps where they went from like being dead broke to being famous. And that was never like that for me. It always kind of just felt like a logical progression, like the next step and the next step. Um, but, uh, that, that was definitely one of the biggest moments for me, getting the guy who was the biggest guy in cable news, who left cable news or was forced to leave cable news and is now even bigger than he was then. That was pretty cool to have him on, have him on the show. And I thought it was a really interesting show. Oh, it definitely was. And it got some feedback, let's say. <laughs> from, yeah. You know, from Conservatism Inc. Because, well, let's just mention the, I think the issue that annoyed them the most, which was that, you guys had unkind things to say about Bill Buckley, William F. Buckley Jr. of National Review and of, you know, other conservative activities. And he had a television show on PBS called Firing Line. And incidentally, Dave, I'll say in parentheses, Firing Line periodically would have specials where it would be a two-hour debate. It would be three on three. It'd be Buckley against some other intellectual, then maybe two academics, and then mm-hmm. two actors from Hollywood. And so it'd be a three-on-three debate 
with one person in each category. And it would be fascinating. And you, we don't have anything like that. And so I remember, I've mentioned this before, but I wrote to Austin Peterson years ago when he was a producer for Judge Napolitano. And I said, why don't you push to have at least a shorter equivalent of the old firing line debates? Because nobody's doing that. And if yeah. you had a debate on non-interventionism in foreign policy, and you had the best people on both sides, people would watch that. That would be television that is not repeated anywhere else, and there was just no interest in it at all. I, I don't understand. But anyway, the point is, I mean, I rather liked Buckley when I was growing up because that was all I knew. All I had was Bill Buckley. You, you don't know what it was like, Dave, when all you had was National sure. Review and Bill Buckley's television show. <laughs> like, that was it. Right. So I wasn't looking for things to criticize, and I didn't even know half the things but in particular, his his casual uh, point about we need to erect a totalitarian bureaucracy within our shores indefinitely in order to defeat the Soviet Union, that was a little bit of a problem. Um, but what I found interesting was these younger um, conservatives, let's say, who had never heard anybody in, 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 to, the, to the right of them or in, that, in their, you know, their area um, say anything negative about Buckley, were shocked about this. But the thing is, they themselves never mention Buckley. Buckley's name never comes up. Yeah. I mean, say what you will about Murray Rothbard, but his name comes up. People still talk about him and his ideas. It's it, Buckley is just gone. But yet, yeah, the, they still feel like he's he's a uh, you know an unquestionable icon. What was your take on all that? Yeah. So uh, for people who didn't, didn't see the show, basically what happened was I just mentioned what we were talking about, kind of like the atrophy of intelligence in America. And I just brought up William F. Buckley just saying like, and, and I just, as a, an aside, like, and I didn't even think of it. I just go, and I consider him like a great villain. Um, but he was impressive and he was intelligent. And that was kind of the point. I, I swear, after we recorded that episode, if you had told me something you guys said here is going to go viral for being controversial, I, I, I don't think if you had given me 15 guesses, I would have guessed that the comment about Bill Buckley. What and it's it's my own thing because I'm I'm biased by my own perspective, and I come from this, you know, Mises Institute, Rothbardian, Woodsian world where you know I was just like, oh yeah, Bill Buckley was a bad guy. Isn't that a known fact? Weren't we all like aware of that? <laughs> <laughs> was that was that still up for debate? I thought that was just like a guy. But th there there is something interesting about it, particularly if you've uh, if you've ever read um, Rothbard's critiques of of William F. Buckley the the quote that you mentioned, I, I blanking on the name of the piece um, that Buckley wrote it in, but Rothbard wrote a, a counterpiece to it called oh, like it was Buckley. Called, it was a huge, huge cover story in National Review called In Search of Anti-Semitism. Yeah, okay, right. And, and he then, found the uh, anti-Semitism. He found it at The Nation. He found it you know, in his old friend Joe Sobrin, whom he embarrassed in front of the world, uh, right. and one or two others, all of whom smashed Buckley right back and then Rothbard just couldn't take it, so he smashed him, too. And I, I believe it was Buckley Revealed was the name of Rothbard's uh, um, response to it, which is really great. I highly recommend people. If you, know, if, if you go to the Mises.org and just type in Murray Rothbard, William F. Buckley, it'll come Some will right come up. up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah there's, there'll be a ton. And then particularly in the book, The Betrayal of the American Right, uh, where Rothbard really gets into it. But th what's interesting is that, right, like you said, Buckley is not a relevant figure anymore. Nobody's really talking about him. But the reason why so many of the, like Ben Shapiro had to make a response video to it and the Blaze put out a, a thing about it and that is because they know, even though I'm sure a lot of younger conservatives don't, but they know kind of the essence of what we're really getting at there when you blast Buckley is that he is probably more responsible than any other figure for turning the conservative movement from being a somewhat isolationist, non-interventionist, gr you know, group into being the cold warrior, what we kind of know now as neocon hawks. And he wasn't like a neocon in that, in the Straussian school of it, but he really was, he really did represent everything that is the, what came to be the George W. Bush Republican foreign policy. And that, that was like a major transformation. And it was terrible, not just for our country, but for the world. And um, so anyway, I think there's something about rejecting him is clearly a repudiation of all of that. 
and the people who want to be more hawkish, particularly right now with what's going on in Israel, I think really kind of are like, well, what do you mean? What's the problem with Bill Buckley? Um, so that was, it was just very interesting to see that whole reaction about a guy who, yeah, you would think, I mean, who really today has some like passionate tie? You dare not criticize William F. Buckley. And then just zooming out was really interesting to see Ben Shapiro go, I mean, what do you have a problem with? I mean, this was the guy who was like the most prominent, influential member of the conservative movement in the, you know, second half of the 20th century. And it's, I, I just, again, I'm so removed from that type of thinking, but it's almost just fascinating to me. Like I was never just a standard conservative. I know you kind of were before you became yeah. a, a libertarian or maybe, maybe even a little bit better than a standard conservative. You were probably not one much. of the more, you know, like, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, not right. much better. <laughs> um, uh, but to me, it's like, how could any conservative like if you're going to you're looking over a little bit of a large time frame here. So say you're looking over like post World War II to say the end of the 20th century and you'd go, "Yep, conservatives, they really did their thing. They conserved what was best about this <laughs> culture, you know? I mean, all of it, right? Religion and family and the constitution and the bill of rights and you know, you guys haven't even conserved conserved the definition of woman. Like, it's just like, how could you look at this movement and not at least go, yeah, whoever was leading that, you've got some questions to answer. What, what exactly did you conserve? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And combined with that, the fact that you could tell he wanted to keep the conservative movement, quote unquote, respectable, the kind of movement <laughs> filled with people who'd get invited to the cocktail parties. And so he would denounce and kick out anybody who might make him not respectable. So Murray Rothbard, of course, was one, and there's a long list of them. And so when Rothbard died, uh, Buckley wrote a nasty obituary. Mm -hmm. So not a, not a nice guy, we'll say. But, but that was his attitude. That makes me think that in 2023, if your attitude is, well, above all, we have to maintain respectability, that Buckley would have been on the wrong side of a lot of things. Yeah. Oh, no question about it. And and you you know that just every foreign policy decision since the, his death, he would have been bad on. There's really no question about it. And yeah, I mean, I think this is, in many ways, I think this is what Trump, the rise of Donald Trump in 2016 kind of represented. Um, you know, I, if you remember, and this is like ancient history uh, at this point, I guess, but in 2012, do you remember when Mitt Romney had his binders full of women moment? Um, which was basically so someone was accusing him of not having hired enough women. And it was when he, what he was saying was, uh, he was like, no, no, no. I, I was trying to hire as many women as I could. I was asking them to bring me binders full of women. Please bring me all the women and I'll hire women. And then they went, did you just say binders full of women? You sexist. And it was like, it was this moment of like Mitt Romney on his knees begging, like, please, I'm respectable. I'm not any of the <laughs> isms that you would call me. And they went, that's the most sexist thing I've heard yet. And there was, and then you, you, you know, you fast forward to like Trump, who's like, you know, the grab him by the, you know what guy. And there's just something there where it was almost like the, the conservatives in America were like, hey, look, we, they kind of woke up to this idea that it's like, we can try to play this respectability game all you want. They're still going to call us every name in the book. This is just, this strategy is just a demonstrable failure. You can't, now again, that doesn't mean that we have to like, and I say we, I'm not a conservative, but that doesn't mean that conservatives have to tolerate any type of bigotry or like if there was like a really ugly, nasty form of it, they couldn't distance themselves from that. But the idea of like trying to, to, you know, cast out anybody who might be interesting because maybe there's something politically incorrect about them. It's just a losing game. And then I would also mention, as, as Rothbard points out, there's like, look, William F. Buckley did work for the CIA. And the, they can say, oh, he worked for the CIA for a couple of years and then left and then formed National Review. But that's at least enough to raise an eyebrow and, you know, there were some other people uh, who were involved in National Review who also had ties to the CIA. And I will say it, it does seem a little bit convenient 
that all of the people you mentioned who who Buckley successfully drove out of the conservative movement, and not just our guys like like Rothbard, but you know the John Birch guys and a, and a whole bunch of others, uh, some Randians too. Um, but it does seem awfully convenient. Let's well, let's just say as a coincidence, it happened to really help out the CIA agenda. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. it, it just happened to work really well for all, like basically all of this whole giant honeypot that is the U.S. federal government, where the way they they make all of their friends rich is through very high government spending and very high military budgets. And all of the people who were against that were conveniently drummed out of the movement. And all of the people who, and, and to be fair, they still kept some conservatives in who would talk about reducing spending, but none who would actually ever do it when they had the power to do it. And so they, there was this very, you know, very convenient aspect to it. And I'll let, you know, people speculate on what they think is really going on there. Not that I have the answer, but that was, I think that's another element to how, how a lot of people looking at this really think like this whole thing was not just ineffective, but it, it became profoundly corrupted. Hey everybody, it's a message from Old Woods here. Now you know that a lot of content creators have Patreon or whatever. And you also may remember when you were little, those PBS fund drives, if you donated, they gave you like an umbrella. I think it's bad luck for me to actually have this umbrella open in the house. Well, I'm here to tell you, you don't need any of that because you should become a member of the Tom Woods Supporting Listeners Program because you get way more than a crummy umbrella and way more than anybody else is giving you. So for example... Even the lowest contribution level gets you every month in the physical mail. Remember the physical mail? My 16-page newsletter. That's right. It's not the same as the emails. It's all fresh, original content. 100 octane woods. Yes, I know that's not correct usage. I don't care. 100 octane woods delivered to your mailbox every single month. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing, you know I host murder mystery dinner parties all over the country. Well, you know what? If you're supporting listener of the Tom Woods Show... You can go to those for free. You don't have to pay one extra cent. You become a member also of the Tom Woods Show Elite, which is my no censorship group, which, by the way, helped to keep a lot of people sane during COVID. You get transcripts of all the interviews I do. You get an invite to my Christmas party, which features a guest speaker and a dinner prepared in my home by a chef. And that's just what you get at the lowest level. So don't spend your life asking yourself what might have been. Go to supportinglisteners.com right now and be a part of all the awesomeness. You know, I've gotten to know over the years uh, several people uh, who have been in the CIA. And um, the, the impression that I've gotten, so not just from supposition or connecting dots, but actually from talking to people, is that the CIA is in everything. Like, if, if you don't know the half of it. So I remember years ago when I heard Rothbard speculate, as you suggest, that maybe Buckley brought a little bit of his CIA allegiance to what he did afterward, uh, because everything he did seemed to favor the, you know, what we call today the deep state. You know, when push came to shove, he was on their side. I thought, oh, okay, well, that's a that's a step too far, Murray. But now I think, boy, how naive I was. Nothing's a step too far for these people. But here's another thing about Buckley. He's one of these people who had second thoughts about the war in Iraq. You know, the sophisticated people, they all were part of the, 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 the herd mentality, the group think, we have to go wage this war. But then the, the sophisticated ones, had, but well, they had, I've had second thoughts, and so perhaps we shouldn't have done this the way we did. Yeah. But you know what? I'm not saying you have to be infallible. But the war in Iraq was one of the dumbest, I mean, dumbest as being extremely yes. charitable things of the 21st century or in all of American history, really. So I'm kind of more interested in not your second thoughts, but your first thoughts, especially if you're the leader of the movement and you're supposed to be really smart intellectual. You couldn't see what a, a dummy in second grade could see. That's a problem. And so that's, that to me is one of the problems with Ben Shapiro is that his first thoughts are, all, are, are, I won't say they're always wrong, but on key things, his first instincts are wrong. So the Nicholas Sandman thing from that, that uh, Covington Catholic mm -hmm. High School where th there was that Native American drummer who was just trying to make peace and whatever. And none of that was true. You saw the context of it. This guy was a creep. 
And there, there were black nationalists who were denouncing Native Americans right within earshot of him. He couldn't care less. Meanwhile, there's a group of Catholic, Catholic high school students. He's going to go intimidate them. Anyway, uh, Ben Shapiro's first instinct was to attack Nicholas Sandman and 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 let you know, in effect, let the left know. Look, I'm respectable, and I wouldn't if I had been there. I would yeah. have made sure. You know, so that was his instinct. His instincts on COVID were not initially good. So well, on horrible. things where we want you to be good right off the bat, he's not good. So in that way, he's a descendant of Buckley. Yeah, well, and and look, man, first of all, with the Nicholas Sandman thing, there was like no evidence. There was one still shot of, of a child with a half smile on his face. And that was enough <laughs> to go like, you know, so look, I'm not like being too much of a stickler on this. And by the way, because I just finished reading your book, which is so good, man. It was just so excellent. And I can't wait to interview you about that on my show in a couple of days here. But the, you, Ben Shapiro was saying, because it puts it more in perspective after reading this. He was saying, get the vaccine dopes, you know, like stop being an idiot. Think about where that falls in the timeline. Th this is, we're in 2021 already at this point. And this is, and I think he said this, go double check the month, but I think it was March or April of 2021. This is a full year of us knowing what COVID is and knowing who's like really uh, at risk of this and who's not at risk of this, like overwhelming data of who's actually at risk of, of uh, a, a seriously negative outcome from COVID. And at this point already, so many of us had already had COVID and already had natural immunity. So it was very, it made total sense for so many people to be like, I'm going to wait and see at the very least with this new experimental vaccine was still experimental at the time. So it, yeah, I mean, there's, now I'm not trying to be too much of a stickler. If there was someone who was tweeting in March of 2020, or in April of 2020, hey, I really think we should be socially distancing or maybe, maybe these lockdowns are necessary. I'm not going to like rake them over the coals for that. But there does have to be some type of reasonable standard where either if it's so obvious at first or if after time you still haven't looked back at that evidence and like adjusted your opinion, then I don't know if we're just in the business of telling people what we think. How many times are you allowed to be so catastrophically wrong with what you think and not pay somewhat of a price for that? And this is the, one of the biggest problems with American policy is that like nobody pays a price. You know, I, I did a segment um, on my show the other day criticizing Douglas Murray, uh, who I didn't know very much about, but I just saw him having this debate on uh, the topic of the war in Gaza. And I didn't think he was making good points. And people were saying, oh, he's making great points. So I was like, well, let's like, let's break this down. And then people have been sending me more of his stuff. And I, I mean, dude, there's like an article from 2022 where he's like, I, I just went to Ukraine and Ukraine will win if America gives them the support we need. And he was a big supporter of the war in Iraq. And I don't know, I haven't done my homework on all the wars in between then. But it's like, how many wars can you be catastrophically wrong about and then still stand up and go, guys, we got to fight this next war. And this one's going to work out great before it's like, like, wouldn't you talk, if you, if you had advocated to fight like five wars in a row and every one of them were just indefensible at this point, you were just wrong. I, you can't defend the statement, Ukraine will win if America gives them help. That's just not, that's not right. And then you'd still get up and advocate for the next one and demonize the people who oppose you at the same time. I'm sorry, but these are people who should not be the thought leaders of any movement. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's interesting that, of course, We've seen a lot of censorship and suppression of, of dissident voices, but now some of the people who really should be the thought leaders, people who haven't been catastrophically wrong on things, like you, for example, are suddenly rising to the top. And so the internet is not all just frustration over I, I'm, getting, I'm getting shadow banned or whatever. It still is a liberating advancement uh, for mankind because it does mean that the people who are presented to us as our thought leaders. Like Bill Kristol for years was presented to conservatives as a thought leader. But yeah. now he is mercilessly mocked and ridiculed in ways he couldn't have been before because there was no forum in which to do it. So there are some things that encourage me. And by the way, you know, I don't want to obsess over this Nicholas Sandman thing, but, but, but you know what, Dave, maybe I do. Because that whole thing about, you could say he was wrong and there, you know, there were other, other people who called themselves conservatives who got that wrong. The reason that's revealing, it's not that, I'm, again, it's not that I'm saying everybody has to be absolutely perfect. It's what kind of instincts do you have? Mm -hmm. It's that 
The left does not do that. The left would not rush to throw somebody under the bus to appease conservatives and say, hey, wait a minute, I want you to know we're not like that and make, make sure and understand that I'm a respectable person. That thought never crosses their mind, never. And so maybe that might have something to do with the fact that they're kicking our asses and, yeah. you know, and, and we're sitting back and taking the boot on the neck. We're just, that, that we're playing a losing game where we're get where the game is rigged against you. If only one side has to grovel to the other side, like which side do you think is going to win? And you know, the thing with that case, what was so interesting about that is that for, once the details actually came out, the, those kids could not have handled the situation better. No. I mean, like these were, these were teenagers who w were getting verbally abused and called racial slurs and did not retaliate did not call racial slurs back. They, 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 he sat there and just kind of smiled, kind of trying to diffuse the situation. They, all the adults involved were like horrific from the, the black Israelites who were just shouting racial slurs at everybody to the Native American guy who's getting in his face and playing the drum in his face, like totally provocative and just uh, um, uh, immature and just wrong. And But the thing is that what you had is you had this group of kids who were Catholic kids who came to attend a pro-life rally, and, and one of them was wearing a Make America Great Again hat. And so immediately, they were cast as, you must be the evil ones. But like, okay, you can understand why the leftist might want to view things that way, but why would anyone on the right want to view things that way? <laughs> That's your thing. Everything about them is like your thing. So it was just unbelievable that you could, uh, you know, th this could even happen. And I don't know. I, I believe the the numbers were never disclosed because I think they settled, you know, uh, uh, before it went to trial. But I know that kid, that kid probably yeah. got a huge amount of money and good. Yeah, I, I can't think remember. Twice. CNN, the CNN had to pay him, and I think maybe the Washington Post was the other one. I can't remember, but uh, it was definitely CNN. But he he hit some of the big guys pretty hard, so that was good. And I'll just say in parentheses because then we want to talk about some other things, but. The, the bishop of, I don't know if it was Lexington, Kentucky, it was it's somewhere in Kentucky. Oh, yeah. The bishop threw the kids under the bus, mm -hmm. too. And, and, and I'll, I'll just tell you something. <laughs> if you're a conservative Catholic and you ever get into a media problem like this, do not rely on your local bishop because he is your enemy. Yeah. He, he will be on the other side as fast as he can get there because what he craves is mainstream respectability, too. I mean, the, the American Episcopate is, you know, with the occasional odd exception is is really, really a bunch of spineless. And, you know, I, I even spineless, I think, gives them too much credit because that makes it sound like, well, if they had a little more courage, they'd want right. to do the right thing. I don't even give them that much credit. But that's a whole, that's an entirely separate episode. Sure. Uh, the la last thing on this particular thing, <laughs> what was also funny about the response to your your interview with with Tucker was how many people refused to mention your name. You, he was Tucker was yes. interviewed by a comedian. And, 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 and of course, Ben Shapiro can't, he can't deign to mention your name. And so a lot of us were thinking, just like out of Breaking Bad, say my name. <laughs> I know. Well, the thing with Ben Shapiro was, right, so they played the clip and then, right, and he said, he goes, he, he was interviewed by a, a comedian who evidently is a libertarian or something like that. And look, I could understand if he was playing a clip from like Rogan and he was like, well, Rogan's latest guest you know, or something like that. I, I kind of go, okay, I mean, he, he, maybe he doesn't know who I am and it is Rogan show, but this was my show. He sought out a clip on my show and it wasn't the clip that was going viral. It was like a longer clip. Like he went in there and got where one of his people did. I have a pretty easy name to remember. Like, I don't know, you must have seen my name all over it, but whatever. Anyway, the, the one with the blaze doing it was pretty funny. It was just like, you know, I've been on Glenn Beck's show twice. And I've, uh, I actually, someone from The Blaze did reach out to me. I mean, I was, I was all saying it kind of tongue in cheek. Like I was like, say my name, Blaze or whatever. <laughs> but uh, one of the people who works there did reach out to me and go, sorry, that was like the person who runs our Twitter, like, blah, blah, blah. You know, so, but I, I was like actually upset about that. But it is, the whole thing is just kind of interesting. Um, to your point before, like, it's, it's not just me. I mean, there's, as much as there are problems with tech censorship, obviously, and there have been really great voices who were suppressed, particularly during the height of COVID, which was really terrible. But look, on on net, it's such an advantage. I mean, we just have, look, even someone like, uh, you know, like Joe Rogan, who is maybe doesn't have the theory down pack that we would all like him to have because he just kind of runs off instincts. 
but he's just been so much better over the last few years than just about, I mean, with very few people, you know what I mean? Like uh, in the corporate press, have he anything even close to as good of a track record as he had? He was totally skeptical from lockdowns to the vaccine mandates to the war in Ukraine, now to the, this war in Israel, um, or I should say the war in Gaza. Um, and, and, that, and him and Tucker Carlson, you know, back, back in the day, as you know, Tom, you know, you got fired from your Fox News gig. Well, that's it. You're gone. You're like removed from the national conversation. And now Tucker's bigger than he ever was. And so there's, yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I'm fine if people don't want to mention my name or whatever. It's like, I'm just happy that the, the clip is getting out there. Cause it's, I, I do think it's like, a, it's, it's, I, I almost think it's going to be, it's going to be very tough to ever put this toothpaste back in the tube. You know, it's not like people who listen to the Joe Rogan experience, if, even if they were able to cancel him or silence him, they're not going back to CNN. They're already levels past that. So I, I do think this is, it's, a, it's an exciting time that we're kind of all participating in. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is a white pill because I think a lot yep. of people very understandably feel discouraged because of the state of society. <laughs> there are a lot of things to be discouraged about. But I, I think the dissident voices are starting to crack through. And that's, that's an encouraging thing. Now, speaking of that, we got to talk for a minute about the Israel-Palestine issue. And I know you have talked about this till you're blue in the face. You debated Laura Loomer. Uh, you've been all over the place on this and talking about it on your own show. Um, and it's a, you know, it's an issue that, that divides people you sometimes agree with on 90% of things. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're at odds with them. And, and this is the only issue they want to talk about is this one and you disagree with them. So it, it creates a, a, drives a wedge between you. Uh, I've had the odd person, uh, I'm, you know, I, what I mean is I, I, the occasional person, <laughs> not necessarily male, some of them are odd write to me to say, well, I'm never listening to you again because you had Daniel McAdams on and you said X or Y. And I felt like when I had Daniel McAdams on, I was really steel manning the Israeli position, asking him things. Well, as an Israeli, I think I would probably right. want to see Hamas dismantled and I would want to do X and Y. And I wanted to see what his response, I mean, you know, that the polling data seems to show that this is not a matter of a majority of Gazans feel put upon by Hamas and they are just as much victims as anybody else. Polling data doesn't seem to support that. So what is an Israeli supposed to do who doesn't want to get killed? I mean, I, I thought I was really steel manning the position. That was not enough for some people. Uh, what's been your experience? You got people writing to you saying, um, or, or, or you know, maybe on Twitter or something saying, that's it, Dave, forget it. I used to like it, you, but now you're a bum. I've gotten some of that for sure. I've also gotten other people who were like, oh, thank you so much for saying the truth. I know this takes courage or whatever, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just decided a long time ago you know, it's just, it's like the way I'm made, like I, Ron Paul was my hero. My, the, my origin story to becoming a libertarian was Ron Paul getting booed out of a building. Like, I just loved that. I was like, that's so awesome that he'll say the thing that'll get everyone to boo him, but he's so obviously right. So that's just, I, I'm not gonna, I can't worry about that stuff. But yes, I have gotten uh, some, some messages like that. And, you know, to the point you made where there'll be some people who are really good on so many things, but then the Israel thing is like totally different. It's not just that like they're good on all these things, but they become bad on this one issue. It's that they become everything that they've been spending their entire career railing against on this one issue. Like the people who have made their careers of being anti-identity politics and anti-censorship, free speech absolutists, all of a sudden you like criticize a government policy and they're like, you're an anti-Semite. And you're like, wait a minute, wait, when did you become a 20-year-old blue-haired social justice warrior? Like, that's your response, really? That I'm a self-hating Jew? Because I think, like, maybe there are some moral issues with occupying a people for 50 years? Like, that I, and I think that under those conditions, it's pretty predictable that they're going to try to fight back and not in the most not elect the most moderate people the one chance they got, uh, they had an election. I, I So, it's to, and then also supporting like um the these some of these laws that are are uh, you know like really banning speech um like the one in Florida and and then also just invoking this thing where it's like the the Jewish college students feel unsafe but all all of a sudden this is you're actually you're becoming the safe space advocates after what you've been saying for the last decade so there's just there's a lot of that around and you know. Believe me, I know 
it's like where we're at in American politics today, it's so everything is a reaction to the other side. And everybody's going like, oh, look at what this, look at what the, these leftists on college campuses are saying, or look at what this, you know, this horrible person over here said. And, and I'll be the first to admit that uh, a lot of, let's just say a lot of the pro-Palestinian left-wing advocates are probably helping Israel more than anybody else. And they're certainly not the people you would want to be out there leading the charge of an issue if you agreed with them on it. But like... At a certain point, all of that is just noise. It's all just a distraction. And what actually matters is like, what's actually happening? What's actually happening in this conflict? What's the history of the conflict? Who are the players? What crimes have they committed? And that's, I, I think if you just focus on that and you're honest, you can't get away from the fact that if you're going to talk about this conflict, you're talking about a situation where a, a group of your Europeans decided they wanted a homeland in an area where other people were living. They got huge uh, amounts of international financing to do it. They built up their own militias and trained for years preparing to drive these people off of their land. When they got the opportunity to, they did it. They drove them off by the hundreds of thousands. Then 20 years later, they, they, fought, they launched a preemptive war. They won it. And they, they seized these areas where... Five million today, Palestinians are still living, and they've been controlling it ever since. They've been either occupying it or not occupying it, but blockading it and completely dominating uh, th those regions since 1967. And that's just unacceptable. And that no, no, there's no other situation where we would accept a uh, advanced Western country doing this to another group of people, let alone for this amount of time. And if you just, if you're going to look at the conflict and ignore that part of it, then I think you're just not really talking about what is actually happening here. And, and, and as Americans, we're all complicit in this because it's America who's been propping them up the whole time. Hey, everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Persist SEO. If you are getting buried by your competition online, then build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow with digital marketing by Persist SEO. If you are a small local business trying to compete against large companies in the service industry, then increase your visibility with Persist SEO. Or what if you have low or no leads coming in on a consistent basis? Well, then website search engine and conversion optimization can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model for you. Are you tired of cold calling and networking, meeting places getting shut down? Use your website as a lead generation engine. Or what if you're not showing up for your services in the search engines? Well, get found with Persist SEO's expert search engine optimization. All you have to do is call 770-580-3736 or visit them at ineedseo.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's 770-580-3736 or ineedseo.help. Let me say a name, and I want to get your thoughts on her. And it, it is somewhat related to this issue, but not entirely. Uh, the name is Candace Owens. What do you think about her? You know, I don't like, I don't actually know that much about Candace Owens. I know that she's had that, this kind of split with Ben Shapiro over this issue. And I, I give her credit for that. And I think that, uh, I think that that took courage to, you know, if you're at the Daily Wire and you're making a lot of money, I'm sure at the Daily Wire, you have a very good career. Um, it would certainly make life easy for you to, you know, Maybe just not talk about this issue that much. Or yeah, say just one shut or two up about things. It. Yeah, right. or say one or two things, but not man, she's her attitude has been like, no, I'm gonna say what I think. And then for her to have Norman Finkelstein on her show on the Daily Wire is like, you know, this is making Ben Shapiro's blood boil that you would have this guy on. And so I don't know that much about her other than that, but I I do find that to be impressive. And I gotta say, I I respect that. Well, here here's why I bring her up because I completely misjudged her. I really thought she was another one of these empty-headed conservatism inc. I have nothing to contribute uh, kind of people. And I was just wrong about that. And when I'm wrong about somebody, I, I want to make things right. Although, you know, somehow she's, she's proceeded pretty well in her career, despite the <laughs> mental reservations that Tom well, how, Woods also, has about you, her. You may but not even have been so, wrong, I just want to uh, clear the air there because I, I've observed her taking dissident and correct positions on a bunch of things. So 
you know, in the conservative movement, it, it was not easy in early February to be uh, to have a skeptical view of the Ukraine intervention, for yeah. example, because there were a lot of big, loud voices uh, with a lot of money that that wanted that. And she was good on that. She was great on COVID. She was great on the shots, uh, on uh, things where, again, I think the the conservative movement officially was not as good and certainly would have been much worse. Could you imagine the conservative movement of the mid-1980s standing up against the public health establishment? They would have been mortified to do that. These yeah. are the experts. You know, yeah. we're, we're conservatives. We believe in knowledge. They would have had some, some BS excuse. But I feel like she and George Floyd, too, she's gone right to the heart of some of the key components of the regime's narrative. And yeah, I totally misjudged her. I mean, good for and even if well, she is well, wrong I kinda had the same... on one or two of these things, as you say, she could have had a much, much more peaceful life by just shutting up and going along. And you got well, I mean, I, I kind I, of I, had I mean, at least for me, even if I disagree with somebody, when I see that they go out on a limb that benefits them in no way, I respect that. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And, you know, like, again, disclaimer, like, I, I haven't, like, consumed a ton of her content, but I kind of had the same impression you did, that when I first saw her, I was kind of like, ah, this is just, like, she's really got nothing to say. Um, just a, why I left the left type of, you know, they're the real racists or something like that, and I'm just kind of boring to me. But I also think it's possible, like, I don't know exactly how old she is, but she's not too old. So it's also possible that we saw her when she was just much younger, and she just kind of got better. Like, she improved over the years and then yes. got comfortable in the role and because because that does happen too. So, yeah. But I will, I completely agree with you. I give her a lot of credit for all of that stuff. All right. L last thing I want to talk about, it's just something about the GOP primary. Now, to some degree, I have no dog in this hunt. But in another way, since I live in this country, it does kind of matter to me what happens. So yeah. I do follow it with, with some interest. And I want to say something about um, Ron DeSantis and get your thoughts. Now, He's, they ran his campaign all wrong. They, uh -huh. they positioned him as a boomer. They didn't have, he should have been on your show. He should have gone on all the big shows the way Vivek did. I mean, they made uh -huh. a deliberate attempt to get Vivek in front of our audiences so that we could, uh, he could be heard. And I mean, I had him on several times. You've had him on. Um, I, I can't remember if Malice has had him on, but, uh, he was but on whatever. I mean, he, show. He, he made the rounds. And so DeSantis, that was another, that was a big mistake. But beyond that, um, I, I know that as a conservative, DeSantis is going to have some positions that that my listeners and I are just not going to like. That's not the point. The point is he's appealing to a conservative audience. So some of the things that annoy us, they love. And so what what I find extraordinary about this is being fully aware of DeSantis's weaknesses. The fact is, in Florida, he delivered for conservatives yeah. like no governor has ever delivered for any constituency. Again, even in areas that annoy me, he delivered and against uh, very difficult odds. And yes, he did, uh, no doubt, Trump's initial endorsement got him over the hump in the first of the elections. But the second one, I mean, it was so overwhelming, the victory. Uh, this guy has done everything they wanted him to do. And you would think that the Trump people could say, you know, DeSantis has been a great governor, and I hope he runs in 2028. But now is Trump's time because he has a mission to fulfill or something to finish or wh whatever. They could say something like that. And, and you find a handful of them saying that. But the vast majority of them treat him like the devil. And they just sit there when Trump comes along and says, you know, Florida did third worst on COVID, which is yeah. so, totally wrong. And like he's quoting Fauci talking points against DeSantis, and they're all cheering. Like, are you, are you people, hello? Did you not live through the three years of madness with us? And now just to score points against another political candidate, you're going to throw all that away and act like Fauci was right. And yeah, I meant DeSantis went through third row. Maybe he should have. I mean, this is unbelievable to me. That's not to say that the DeSantis camp hasn't done their share of things, but really he was not the one who started it. And, and I realized DeSantis is way down in the polls. And, you know, and again, here's something. It doesn't benefit me to say these things for DeSantis. I'll say that. That doesn't benefit me in any way. I got a whole lot of Trump people who follow me. But the thing is, the Trump people who are interested in what I have to say are normal people. These are, right. these are people who, if I say this candidate's minuses outweigh his pluses, they realize there's no reason that should cause a break between me and Woods or me and anybody else. Because that's just a judgment call. 
You know, if I betrayed one of my principles and said, you know, central banking is great, then they should reconsider. But a strategic question about, you know, I think this candidate might work out better than another one. I mean, there is no reason for this kind of cultish behavior. Um, I feel like DeSantis has every right to be bitter and resentful about the way he's been treated. That again, maybe maybe you wish to, to support some other candidate, but that's not the same thing as saying, I'm the worst person who ever lived. I mean, the way they treat him and his wife is just beyond belief. Now, maybe I'm off on this. I could be off base on this. What do you well, think? Well, I'm, I mean, I don't think you're completely off base. It's just kind of like, look, man, this is this is politics. And, uh, you know, think about the way they treated Ron Paul. You know, think about the way they've treated some of these people and how unfair it is. The truth is that it, it looks pretty clear to me right now that Ron DeSantis made a really bad decision by running for president. I mean, he took, he was, you know, if you can imagine just where he was in 2022, he was the hero of the the GOP. I mean, this guy, like you said, he he barely got over the hump uh, in, in his first election. He won by 20 points in his reelection. He turned a purple state solid red and strictly because he got the most important issue right. And he was just Mr. Winner. And then he decided to try to get in between a pit bull and his bone. And yeah, you're right. It's not fair. You know, I don't know. I'm a little torn on the situation because, look, Ron DeSantis was much better than almost every other governor on COVID. And that meant so much during COVID. And Donald Trump was so bad on COVID. Um, and, you know, you in your book, you go through the whole timeline. You know, it's like the, that that all first year of it, that's on Trump. He, the, the ball stopped, you know, the, the buck stopped with him, um, at least with a lot of this stuff. And so the fact that uh, Donald Trump will attack, has the nerve to attack DeSantis on his COVID track record is like so unbelievably wrong. And just, so I, I'm with you on that. But on the other hand, I'm also, you know, Ron DeSantis is just so bad on Israel. And you just know as president, it's a blank check for whatever they want. So I'm not particularly interested in the guy becoming president. Yeah, but president. the thing is, most of the Trump people are too. Not all, but most are too. So that's not their yes. complaint. No, I, I agree. No, 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 no. I'm saying that's not their complaint, but it's my complaint. And I also just think he's, uh, he was a total coward on Ukraine, like said at one point it was a border dispute, then walked it back when his donors wanted him to. He's totally, he's trying to play this middle of the road game yeah. where he can say something that's still acceptable to the big donors, but enough for the, 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 voting, the, the voting base. But the problem is that the voting base hates the big donors' guts. There's just no playing both sides of this. You had to pick, like, even if you're just being smart, like if I, it's like, go to the donors in private and tell them this is all an act and I'm going to do whatever you guys want me to do once I get in. Don't worry about it. But I got to go say something else to these people because it's the only way I'm going to get them over. He, there's just, there's a loyalty that Trump supporters have to him. And what really shot DeSantis in the foot is two things. Number one, he's just not that good at campaigning. Um, he's not very charismatic. He wears weird shoes that make it seem like they're lifts. I don't know if they are or not. He's awful in these debates. He does these things where, have you seen this thing where he like tries to make a smile and makes the weirdest face I've ever seen a human being make? It's just, he's not good at this. And the, and the second thing is that they, they weaponized the legal system against Donald Trump and that just solidified it for Donald Trump in voters' minds. That it's like, the, and, and I, I will say somewhat understandably, that is just like, no, we're not going to let them do this to our, our guy. And I think DeSantis just has no path at this point. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand that. I understand that. But, but even so, I mean, you could, make, you could at least make a strategic argument that there's no necessary connection between our guy is being unjustly railroaded or is, is being treated absurdly by the legal system and this is the best candidate we have or, or this is the candidate we should run. Oh, no, it's it's purely just that he was the biggest threat to Donald Trump at the beginning, at least. And so Trump decided this is how Donald Trump works, right? Like he wasn't think about how he was toward Rand Paul where they were running. He was horrible to him. And for no reason, Rand Paul like really never did anything wrong. He wasn't like the swamp that Donald Trump was complaining about. He was like the one decent guy there in the Senate. And by the way, Donald Trump could have given his dad credit because he borrowed a lot of his like talking points from him. 
Um, but no, it was like, you're short, your hair is weird, you're ugly, you're a loser. <laughs> That's how Donald Trump is. And, you know, however, it's it's quite a show. But yeah, it's a, if you're saying like there's a, that's that's kind of like a a person of good character shouldn't do that. Well, yeah, but you're not going to get that from Donald Trump. Yeah, and, and I say this as a guy who's very entertained by him, who likes yeah, when he sure. smacks bad guys, who likes when he embarrasses people and makes people, when he makes people laugh at bad guys, I like that as much as any red-blooded American. I, I have no objection to that. I wouldn't you know, want to change his style or anything. It's just that now that I had a chance to live through four years of it, I, I'm, I'm less interested in the style and I'm more interested in like, well, what do you have to show no, for yourself? No, I, I completely I, I agree. More, I, I mean, you, you appointed 100%. Nikki Haley to be your UN ambassador. I mean, where would you, what, what headspace would you have to be in to he's make that the, kind of choice? Donald Trump is the reason why Fauci was the face of the COVID response. He kept them up there, and he may have not been technically in the head of the task force, but he was up there talking to the American people every day through 2020, and that's because Donald Trump let him be that guy. And like, do, like you're not, you, you're not wise enough to like just give Rand Paul a call. I mean, I know he's an eye doctor and he's not a virologist or whatever, but give him a call and go, hey, who's a really good epidemiologist? Like, who's somebody who I who I could trust who's outside of this swamp who, like, maybe would give me some good information? Let me put, who who of those guys could I put on? There's just so many different options of what he could have done. And um, and he totally failed on that. So there's this, just something I've been thinking about, and I was curious, like, what your point of view on this is. I was talking about this on my show the other day. But so in our tradition of, of thinkers that we kind of follow, um, there's been different takes on democracy in general. Right. So, and I'm sure most of your audience is an educated audience. They know a lot of this stuff, but like, so Ludwig von Mises, who is the, you know, the godfather, our, our economic, you know, uh, genius, he was part of the classical liberal tradition and he was pro democracy. And his argument was uh, essentially that democracy allows for the peaceful transfer of power. And so, yeah, you want to have democratic processes because this is what allows people to not have to go to war with each other and we can accept the results of an election. And then down to Hans Hermann Hoppe, who completely rejects this and wrote that wonderful book, Democracy, the God That Failed, and talks about how basically you'd rather have the government be privately owned than democratically owned, essentially. That's the better of two bad situations. And I have generally considered myself more in line with the Hoppe view than the, the Mises view. But I will say, and I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts on this are, as they've been making these moves to kick Donald Trump off the ballot, I'm really seeing the wisdom in what Ludwig von Mises said. And I do find this thing where I go, look, I know Ron Paul's not getting elected president this year, and I know 500 Ron Pauls aren't going to Congress and everything's going to go the way I want it to go. I know I'm going to be left with a bad option here, no matter what. But like, for the sake of violence not breaking out, can you just let them have a vote? You know what I'm saying? Like, can you just let they're like, let Donald Trump stand for election so his people at least get to vote and we can have some type of peace in this society. Does that make sense? Or like, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, it does. Like seeing- it does. So I'm with you on that. But then to me, I would turn around and say, but what's happening to Trump now kind of reveals that the alleged democracy is a sham in the first place. That, you know, yeah. when a guy who yeah. even remotely might be a threat to it. Uh, is is treated in this way. I mean, if good grief, if Dave Smith ever ran for president and and had um, his significant poll numbers, could you imagine yeah. what they would do? Because Trump is still, by and large, a creature of the establishment on a lot in a lot of areas, whether it's monetary policy or the federal budget. You know, so I mean, people are still going to get the checks with their names on them under Donald Trump. You know, so that's you don't have to worry right. about that. No agencies are going to be shut down. You can be absolutely certain of that. So if somebody actually was planning to do those things, can you imagine what the response would be? But yeah, it goes to show that democracy in the American context uh, degrades into um, its democracy when, you know, when our side wins. And right, that's, that's, right. how the, that's, no, that's how the neocons point. view democracy all over the world. It's not yeah, democracy that's like, that's, when people we don't like win. Yeah, very good point. All right, let me ask you one last thing. Um, if... I, you know, you have a lot of people who listen to part of the problem, which is great. And the more people who do that, the better a world will will have. But I bet there are plenty of people out there who they'd love to to come to one of your comedy shows. And you know, you mentioned them on on part of the problem, but maybe people missed that part or they didn't hear that episode. 
What's a way people can be absolutely sure that if they want to see Dave Smith and he's come to their town, they won't miss the the notice? Well, uh, uh, comicdavesmith.com, that's the best way. Uh, just go, go to my website. I'm, I'm always uh, like refreshing with the latest dates. I think as of uh, right now, the 2024 dates haven't been put on there yet. But in the next week, there'll be a whole bunch of dates from like January through March and stuff like that. So anywhere I ever go, the ticket link is always up at, at comicdavesmith.com. Can you tell me in parentheses in two sentences, can you describe how your European tour was? It was great. It, it, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was, uh, it was, we were doing like one night in every city. And then, so it was a lot of flying around and a lot of traveling and like, it, it, it was a, a little bit draining. Um, but it's just so cool to be in like Amsterdam and there's like fans of the show who come out who love it. It's just like a, such a weird feeling. And it was, a uh, yeah, it was really fun. And then I, I went there with, uh, Luis J. Gomez and Zach Amico and, and of course, Robbie Bernstein. And so it was just kind of cool to be with good friends going around. And we went to everywhere in Europe where they make bad food. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't oh, have any of the good food spots. We went to London Ugh. and uh, Scotland and Ireland and Amsterdam. And it's just like you go to Europe and you don't have one decent meal. And you see, the problem, Tom, is all the places in Europe where the food's amazing, they don't speak English. <laughs> and all the places where they speak English, the food is like, you're like, it's, uh, I don't know. It really is. I know it's like a stereotype or whatever, but it is infuriating when you're in London and you're like, hey, guys, like France is right there. Like, <laughs> I'll pay for one of them to come over here and teach you all how to cook. Because you, you go to Paris and like everything's the most delicious meal you ever had in your life. You go to Italy, you can't have a bad meal. But in, in England, they're just, I don't know, the royal family hated spices or something. I don't know the story. Well, I bet you would still, in the capital cities or major cities, these places, you'd, you'd have enough English speakers, they'd still want to come out to hear you. That is one of the Maybe. great benefits of being an English speaker is that you that can go true. to many, many places in the world and fit right in and make a little effort to try to say a few words to them, but they're going to just be happy you're there as a visitor. So, uh, you know, maybe there could be a part two where it's the food <laughs> tour, the Dave yeah, Smith food right. tour. You're going to go to all the good places <laughs> and, and you will get plenty of English speakers or English as a second language people coming out to see it. But yeah, boy, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, what you just had to endure. Even though <laughs> yeah. I love all those places. I love them. But so even yeah, Amsterdam, great. you didn't like the food? No, I've never I mean, been maybe, there. Maybe there were good places and I just missed it. But I mean, everything was just not good. That's be beautiful city. Wonderful people. Oh, yeah. But I mean, my God, guys, get it together. <laughs> get it together. You're surrounded by the best food in the world, you know? And uh, Anyway, but it was a lot of fun. It was a great time. That's good. That's good. All right. ComicDaveSmith.com. Part of the problem is the podcast checkout. So uh, go and do that. Dave, hope you have a great 2024. Thanks a lot. Same to you, Tom. Always, always a pleasure to be on your show. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free. And we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.